Today, we're going to learn all about cosets in group theory, and I think you'll be quite surprised by the importance of this definition and the results that all of this is going to lead to. Not long after this, we will attain a full understanding of every group with a prime number of elements. So this is some really cool stuff. In this video, we'll go over the definition of coset. We'll see some examples, both finite and infinite, and we will cover a couple of the important results concerning cosets, and we will do a simple proof, proving that if two cosets have common elements, they must in fact be the same cosets. Let's get into it. Here is the definition. Let G be a group and H is a subgroup of G. Then, for any element X in the group G, we let XH denote the set of all products XH as X remains fixed and H ranges over the subgroup H. In this case, we call XH a left coset of H in the group G. Similarly, we can define a right coset of H in the group G. And here in set builder notation are the definitions of left cosets and right cosets. It's important to remember that X can be any element of the group G, but the coset is created by taking every element from the subgroup H and multiplying it by that group element X. We could do the multiplication uh, of X on the left to give us a left coset, or we could do the multiplication of X on the right to give us a right coset. In practice, it doesn't really matter if we're going to talk about left cosets or right cosets. It's more important that we are consistent, and any results proven about left cosets could analogously be proven for right cosets. For this video, we'll mostly talk about right cosets, where our fixed group element is composed on the right. So, of course, since X can be any group element and we are composing it with every element of the subgroup H when we create a coset, these elements in the coset might not belong to the subgroup H, but they will certainly belong to the group G because everything in H is in G and X is in G. And so when we look at the coset, which contains these elements HX, those will also be in G. So every coset in G is certainly a subset of G. Let's see some examples. Let's begin with a finite example. So our group G will be the additive integers mod four, and our subgroup will be this set H containing zero and two. I'll let you check quickly that indeed H is a subgroup of G. Now, of course, the integers mod four contain 0, 1, 2, and 3, so we could take any of these four elements to start creating cosets of H in the group G. Let's begin with the element 1. If we want to create a right coset of H in G using the element 1, we want to combine 1 with everything in the subgroup H, and we're combining 1 on the right. In this case, it doesn't matter because addition is commutative, but in other cases, it might matter. So we'll look at the coset H plus 1. In the definition of coset, we were using multiplication notation. In this example, it is addition, so we should use this additive notation for the coset. And what is this equal to? Well, we just have to look at the elements of H and add 1 on the right. That's what produces our coset. So first we have 0, and 0 plus 1 is just 1. Then we have 2, and 2 plus 1 is just 3. And this is our coset. This is the right coset of H with 1 in the group G. So creating a right coset by adding 1 gave us this set with 1 and 3. What if we create a right coset by adding 3? What will this give us? Well, we'll have 0 plus 3, which is just 3, and then we'll have 2 plus 3, which is 5, but mod 4, that's just 1. 
And so you see that, in fact, we get the same thing as we got before, the set containing 1 and 3. And this sort of pattern is true in general. If we have a coset that's got some element, if we take that element to create another coset, the cosets will be the same. Said another way, if two cosets have elements in common, they are, in fact, exactly the same cosets. They'll have all of their elements in common. And this is the result that we'll prove in a couple minutes after we do another example or two. Like I said, just to keep things consistent, we'll typically work with right cosets, but just to see the other possibility, let's do a left coset. What if we look at 2 plus h? So this left coset of h and g, what would this be? Well, again, we've just got to combine 2 with each element of h. So 2 plus 0, that would give us 2, and then 2 plus 2 gives us 4 which mod 4 is 0. This set with 2 and 0 happens to be the set H itself, and of course, if we look at the coset produced by adding 0 on the left, since 0 is the identity in this case, that would also just give us the set H right back. An important thing to notice here is that our cosets actually partitioned the group. Every element of our group is in one of the cosets, and if two cosets are distinct, they are entirely disjoint. These two cosets are exactly the same, but these two cosets are distinct. They're not just distinct, they are completely disjoint. They have no elements in common. This is a partition, and this is not a coincidence. This is always the case. Cosets will partition a group. So for a group G and a subgroup, group H, the cosets H A as A ranges over G, so look at every possible coset of H in G, all of these cosets will give us a partition of G. And we often use this notation, red G mod H, we use this notation to denote the set of all cosets of H in the group G. This is a really important result, and we will prove it in a future video. I'll leave a link to that in the description. Here's one more example with infinite sets. We could let our group G be the additive group of real numbers, and the integers are a subgroup of those. Then we could look at the coset of the integers created by adding 0.5 on the right. So what we get is just every integer, but shifted up 0.5. 0 is shifted up to 0.5. 1 is shifted up to 1.5. Negative 1 is shifted up to negative 0.5, and so on. So just an example of an infinite coset. Now like we said earlier, if we take any element from this coset and use it to create another coset, it will in fact give us exactly the same coset. It has to, which is what we will prove shortly. For example, we could take 1.5 and use that to make another coset, and it will be exactly the same thing. The integer 0 gets shifted up 1.5 to 1.5. The integer negative 1 gets shifted up 1.5 to positive 0.5. The integer negative 2 gets shifted up 1.5 to negative 0.5, and so on. Same exact coset. So, in general, the cosets of the integers in the additive region reals are just like the integers, but they're shifted up or down by the real number that was used to create the coset. All right, here's the proof that I've been mentioning throughout this video, that if two cosets have an element in common, then they will in fact be the exact same cosets. Said another way, if A is an element of the coset HB, then the coset HA will equal the coset HB. Now, we have to understand that if A is an element of the coset HB, by definition of coset, that means that A is equal to H1 times B for some element H1 of the subgroup H. Remember, H is a subgroup of some group G, but the group G isn't super important for this proof. So, we begin the proof by trying to show that HA is a subset of HB. Then we'll show that HB is a subset of HA. But to show that HA is a subset of HB, we want to take an arbitrary element from HA and show that it's also an element of HB. So we begin by taking an arbitrary X in the coset HA. 
by definition of coset, that means that x equals h2 times a for some element h2 in the subgroup h. However, by our assumption that a is an element of hb, we know that a is equal to some element of h, h1 times b. So if x is equal to h2a, then it must also equal h2 times h1b, which, since the group operation is associative, is the same as h2h1 times b. And this, by definition of a coset, is an element of hb. We know that because h2h1 for sure is an element of h because h is a subgroup. So if we compose two elements of h, we get another element of h. So our arbitrary element x from the coset ha is an element of hb because it equals some element of h times b. Therefore, the coset ha is a subset of hb. Everything in ha is in HB. Now we'll move on to proving that HB is a subset of HA. We begin this by taking an arbitrary element Y from the coset HB. We want to show that this is an element of HA. By definition of coset, this means that Y equals H3 times B for some element H3 in the subgroup H. Now at this step, we would like to replace B with something in terms of A. Just like in the previous step, we replaced A with something in terms of B. Now we can do this if we go back to our original assumption. We assumed, it's part of the hypothesis of this theorem, that A is an element of the coset HB. And that meant that A equals h1 times b for some subgroup element h1. Now subgroups have inverses because subgroups are themselves groups. So this would also mean that h1 inverse times a is equal to h1 inverse times h1, which is just the identity, times b. So that's just equal to b, multiplying both sides of this equation on the left by h1 inverse. All right, so we found an expression for b in terms of a. Let's come back to this step. We know that y equals h3b, but b is equal to h1 inverse a. So this is equal to h3 multiplied by h1 inverse a. Then again, because the group operation is associative, this is the same as h3 times h1 inverse times a. And again, we have two elements of the subgroup H being composed. That must also be an element of H since it's a subgroup. So we have an element of H times A. Then by definition of the coset HA, this has to be an element of HA. So we've shown any arbitrary element of the coset HB is also an element of the coset HA. Thus, HB is a subset of HA, and so the cosets are equal as desired. This simple result has some nice implications, and I'm using additive notation here just because I prefer the look of zero to the look of one. So I like the look of the additive identity. So one of the implications of this is that for a group G and a subgroup H, H plus zero is the only coset with zero. If any other coset has zero in it, then by the result we just proved, it must in fact equal the coset H plus zero. And remember, zero is just the identity here. So this means since H plus zero is the only coset that has the identity, H plus zero is the only coset in G, which is also a subgroup. Any other coset, since it doesn't have the identity, can't possibly be a subgroup. Indeed, we know that H plus zero will always be a subgroup because H is a subgroup and H plus zero by definition is actually just H. So hopefully you found this introduction to cosets useful and interesting. Like I said, there are several more important results we will prove regarding cosets leading up to the big theorem, Lagrange's theorem. Again, as a quick recap of what a coset is, a coset is created by taking some element from the group G and fixing that element and then composing it with every element of a subgroup H. It will be composed on the left to create a left coset or you compose it with 
with every element of H on the right to create a right coset. Cosets, by their definition, are subsets of the group G, and the cosets of a particular subgroup will actually create a partition of the group G. Again, that's a result we're going to prove. And then finally, remember that if two cosets have an element in common, they actually have to be equal. Hope this was helpful. Thanks a lot for watching. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions.